Would you pray with me? God, thank you so much that you do love us. Love us so much that you sent Jesus to live with us, to die for us. Sent the word of life to be among us. And so now as we come to this time, I pray that you would help us to hear your word for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I was going into the fifth grade, and our family was moving into a new home. The house wasn't quite done yet when school started. My parents didn't want me to start in one school and move to another, so I started in the new school where we would be moving. Every morning, my mom would drive me over to the new school, drop me off, and then she'd go to work. After school, I would then walk home, lived about a block and a half away. And I'd go and I'd, if the workers were there, I'd watch them and get in the way. Or if they weren't there, I'd just explore the house. You know, I, sometimes I could actually climb all over the thing and or just have a lot of fun. 45 minutes to an hour later, my parents would show up. And we would then spend a couple of hours working at the house. A number of tasks we had to do, but the primary one that we worked on was painting the house. Inside and out, we painted our entire house. Finished it up. Mid-October, we moved in to the house. Now, there was still a lot to do, but things overall settled down a little bit. My parents didn't come quite as early. They were school teachers, and they could get out for a while, but they still had to teach their classes. Um, so that first month and a half, I don't know how they did it, but after that, they came home a little more at a normal time. One afternoon, I was at the house by myself. My sister was still at school. She was a couple years older, and my parents were still at work. I decided to help. What's that about? <laughs> You know me. <laughs> when in the garage, there were a bunch of boxes there, and I started unpacking one of them. Inside, I found a can of gold spray paint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dangerous weapon in the fifth grader's hands. I got the brilliant idea that our faucets would look brilliant. <laughs> spray painted gold. <laughs> Just the outside ones, folks. I'm not that bad. The inside ones were already shiny. I wanted the outside ones to match. In 45 minutes or so, they did. <laughs> All of them. I don't remember when my parents actually found out what I had done. I know it wasn't that day. It may have been two, three days later, maybe even a week or more. Enough time for the paint to dry thoroughly. Their impression of my artistic ability was not very high. Did you know it's very difficult to erase spray paint? Not only off the faucets, but off the nice newly painted stucco walls and the cement space around the house. Dad wasn't very happy with me at that point. I don't remember exactly what all we did. I think we had to replace one of the faucets. We, when we discovered what was going on, we tried to work the faucets, one of them was frozen shut. I think when we tried to crank it, it cracked, so you had to replace that. The rest of them, well, let's just say 10, 15 later, years later, you could still see gold paint. It was not one of my better moments, I will admit. It. But compared with what a lot of other kids were doing, it wasn't that big a deal. Compared with what I done at other times, it wasn't that big a deal. Compared with what adults have done throughout history, it was nothing at all. I mean, what's spray painting a few faucets? Compared with murder, warfare, and the violence we read about every day. You see, that's the problem. We can't evaluate our lives by comparing ourselves 
to other people. We can't always find someone who is worse than we are, as well as them. No, the standard for our lives is perfection. Yes, perfection. That's what Jesus said, the Sermon on the Mount. Be perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. You might even say that our standard is Jesus Christ. He was fully human. He knew what it was to struggle, what it was to be tempted by sin. And yet he never sinned. He was able to love unconditionally, to forgive fully. He was able to follow God faithfully through events that would have caused any one of us to turn away. Compared with Jesus, you and I will never match up. We've all sinned. Now there's a theological phrase for that. It's called original sin. And people in the church have struggled with that doctrine from the beginning of time, mainly because of what we have right here is two little ones. How do you say that, you know, sin is involved in there? I don't want to go into that. I don't know how to explain that myself. People have debated that. Original sin, well, let me see if I can explain it this way. This guy named Eddie Izzard is his name. He's a British comedian. And as far as I know, he grew up in the church because he had some idea of what original sin was. You know, he heard about that concept, but he really didn't understand it very well. And he thought that original sin meant that priests were bored with hearing confession. People came in to confess their sins, and it was always the same old thing. There was no, no original sins, and they were bored. So Eddie came up with an original sin. I poke badgers with spoons. As far as I know, no one else has ever done that. At least not more than once. But Eddie didn't understand what original sin really was or is. Original sin is the idea that within all of us, there is an inherent tendency toward sin. You could even say it just is a way of saying all of us are sinners. We've all sinned. Some of us have spray-painted faucets. Others have lied, cheated, stolen. We've lusted at people, worshipped things rather than God. We've held back love from people we ought to love. We've not trusted in God's love and mercy. We've broken God's laws. We've turned our backs on God and turned our backs on other people. The list could go on forever. Because we all have sin. This morning, there may be someone here who has never been forgiven of your sin. Maybe someone brings with you a, a sin or a series of sins that you have never confessed. You may never have told anyone about it. And you've never experienced forgiveness. And that becomes a burden that you carry every minute of every day. We can't deal with that burden, so we tend to push it out of our conscience, but it takes incredible energy to get it out of our conscience. Try to forget about it. And, and that energy is energy we don't have available to live. Maybe that describes some of you today. Others here I know may not, you've heard the news, you've confessed your sins, you don't have any deep, hidden, or secret sins. But the truth is, sometime this past week, maybe even this morning, you sinned. Or maybe you don't, can't even think of any specific sins in your life, but you are still a sinner, and you are aware of your need 
for God's grace and forgiveness. We've all sinned and there is absolutely nothing you can do to take away that sin. I mean, you can eventually erase spray paint or cover it up somehow. But there's nothing you and I can do to remove the sin of our lives that disfigures and distorts who we are and who God wants us to be. Sin breaks our relationship with God. And there's nothing we can do about it to restore that relationship. But what we can't do, God has done for us. That brings us back to our scripture this morning. I want to read it again, but this time, instead of reading it out of the, the Pew translation, I want to read Eugene Peterson's version of it. When you were stuck in your old sin dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive, right along with Christ. Think of it, all sins forgiven. The slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. Did you notice what our job is in that? It says you were stuck. You were incapable. We can't do anything about it. But God can. God made you alive. God forgave. God erased the sins. God wiped the slate clean. God nailed your sins to the cross. That, my friends, is the good news. Through Jesus' death on the cross, our relationship with God is restored. Through the cross, we have been forgiven. All we need to do is receive that gift. This morning, whether you are carrying a heavy burden of sin or just have a sense of sin, your own sinfulness, I invite you to turn to the cross. For through the cross, we are forgiven. Praise the Lord. There is, I'm not done this, get don't. But it is worth an amen. amen. <laughs> because not only is our relationship with God restored through the cross, but there's a second consequence. The cross also means that the forces of evil have been overcome. Look at verse 15. God disarmed the ruler's authorities, made a public example of them triumphing over triumphing over them in the cross. Whereas Peterson says, at the cross, God stripped all the spiritual tyrants of the universe of their sham authority and marched them naked through the streets. Our lives sometimes are difficult. Part of that may be our own doing, our sin. But let's also be aware of what Paul talks about as rulers and authorities. We're talking about Satan, the devil, however you want to describe these beings that work against God and work against those who love God and those whom God loves. Now, we're Presbyterians, we don't talk about Satan very much. And I'm not suggesting that we ought to focus all of our attention on the powers of evil. But at the same time, I think it is a mistake to ignore the reality that there are evil beings in this world. That Satan is working against God and attacking God's people. Friends, I would suggest that some, and that, that word some is key, some of the struggles in our lives, some of the struggles that we as a church are facing, some of the struggles that our denomination is facing are a result of Satan attacking us. <laughs> Satan's hope is to keep us from believing in Jesus Christ, to keep us from receiving the forgiveness and salvation offered in Christ. But once we have
that accepted that. He can't take that away. But he can distract us from God. He can draw our attention and our work away from God, and he will use any method he can to do that. But the good news is that through the cross of Jesus Christ, Satan has been defeated. Satan has no power over us other than what we give back to him. We don't need to be afraid of Satan. And that also deserves an amen, Skip. Amen. The powers that want to draw you away from God have been defeated. Philip Yancey wrote a book called Reaching for the Invisible God. And in it, he tells the story of a Bible study that his wife leads at a local nursing home. I want to read you this story. An Alzheimer's patient named Betsy attends, the faithful, attends faithfully at the Bible study, led there by a staff worker. She sits through the hour. Bets, Betsy is slender, with snow-white hair and a pleasant smile. Every week, Janet, that's Nancy's wife, Janet introduces herself, and every week, Betsy responds as if she's never seen her before. When other people interact in the group or laugh at some little joke, Betsy smiles, a distant, disarming smile. Mostly, she sits quietly, vacant eyed, enjoying the change of scenery from her room, but comprehending nothing of the discussion going on around her. After a few weeks, Janet learned that Betsy had retained the ability to read. Often, she carries with her a postcard her daughter sent her several months before, which she pours over as if it came in yesterday's mail. She has no comprehension of what she is reading and will repeat the same line over and over like a stuck record in some, until someone prompts her to move on. But on a good day, she can read a passage straight through in a clear, strong voice. Janet began calling on her each week to read a hymn. One Friday, the senior citizens who prefer the old hymns they remember from childhood selected the old rugged cross for Betsy to read. On a hill far away stands an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, she began, and then she stopped. She suddenly got very agitated. I can't go on, it's too sad, too sad, she said. Some of the seniors gasped. Others stared at her in the years of living at the home, not once. Had Betsy shown the ability to put together words meaningfully? Now, obviously, she did understand. Janet calmed her down. That's fine, Betsy. You don't have to keep reading if you don't want to. After a pause, though, she kept reading and stopped at the same place. A tear marked a trail down each cheek. I can't go on. It's too sad. She said, unaware that she had said the same thing two minutes ago, she tried again and again reacted with a sudden shock of recognition, grief, and the, at the exact same words. Well, the meeting was drawing to a close. The other seniors gradually moved away, heading for the cafeteria or their rooms. They moved quietly away as if in church, glancing over their shoulders in awe at Betsy. Staff workers who had come to rearrange the furniture stopped No one had ever seen Betsy in a state resembling lucidity. Finally, when Betsy seemed tranquil, Janet led her to the elevator to return to her room. And to her amazement, Betsy began singing the hymn from memory. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. New tears fell again and again. But this time she kept going, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best from a world of lost sinners was slain. 
And I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and inherit it someday for a crown. Friends, the world we live in is filled with suffering and shame. As Jesus took to the cross, through, the, through his death on the cross, Jesus overcame the sin of our lives so that we might be forgiven. Through his death on the cross, Jesus defeated the powers of evil so that we don't need to be afraid. Through his death on the cross, 